Everyone wants a get rich quick scheme, and for most normal level headed people, we know this doesn't exist. If it did, everyone would do it. Most people know it takes a lot of time to work to earn the money, unless you're selling drugs or doing criminal activities. But there are people out there who will convince you when you're at your poorest, when you have nothing to your name, and are so desperate for help that will convince you that they have the solution. And one of the best of this is Dan Locke, who's definitely great at what he does, except all he does is pretty much nothing apart from selling you a dream. So, how does he do it? And how did he become one of the supposedly rich? richest and most influential fake gurus out there. Poor people believe that money is the root of all evil. Rich people, we believe that poverty is the root of all evil. Well, Dan would often tell the story of being born in Hong Kong, moving to Canada at age 14 with his mother, where he would be bullied in school for being a quiet, shy Asian guy. At the age of 16, his parents divorced, and he saw his father file for bankruptcy. Watching his mother suffer with this was no money, Dan was motivated to support her. He learned how to speak, read, and write in English, and working his way up the corporate ladder. Dan always repeats that he had 14 failed business ventures before he made it, and became a millionaire by the age of 27. While this is a big accomplishment, he didn't really start making good money until he became a copywriter with the help of a close mentor who helped him open an advertising agency. There he met his wife, Jenny Lee, who was also a server at a restaurant and the two would get married in 2015. All throughout this period, Dan was writing motivational books that were selling very well and he also became a motivational speaker and consultant. Dan went from a quiet kid to a motivational speaker. Not only did he write motivational books that sold well, but he also spoke at TEDx twice, solidifying himself as a brilliant motivational speaker. However, selling books and motivational speaking weren't enough for Dan. He wanted more, and this led to the creation of a course titled High Ticket Closer. You might have come across the concept of high ticket closing and thought it could be a sort of career move. It's tempting, especially with those promises of those major commissions that come with selling big ticket items. The truth is, it's a fake quick hustle and get rich quick scheme. What high ticket closing really is, is working for fake gurus trying to convince people to buy their $10,000 courses of surface level knowledge that they really shouldn't be buying. It's about the equivalent of being a professional scammer rather than a career. The legitimate high ticket sales career is in the technology industry, aka tech sales. In this field, you sell experience expensive technology products to businesses to help them improve their operations and make more money. You can start on this real attainable entry-level career path through a company called Course Careers. And hey, in today's world, most of these remote closing jobs are becoming the norm, giving you the flexibility to work from home or anywhere while still closing those deals and making a bunch of money. And lucky for you, Course Careers has a free introduction course if you click the link in the description below to sign up to learn exactly how you can start your career in tech sales without any previous experience or a degree. Instead of speaking to a crowd at his own cost, people paid him, hoping to attain the same success he had. He plays on the dreams and desperation of people willing to do whatever they needed to keep their heads above water. And with a few cleverly twisted words, he made it seem like his course wouldn't fail those who paid for it and convinced them to fork over $4,000. What they didn't know was they were going to be buying into a cult. While Locke may deny it, much of what he practices in his courses is very cult-like. While his employees and students don't worship a religious figurehead, they do seem to view Dan almost like a god amongst men. It's almost made worse by the fact that he makes everyone refer to him as Shifu, a term often used in martial arts that means teacher or father and is used to pay respect to the person holding the title. He frequently proclaims that he will be his students' lifelong teacher and lead them to success, saying that calling him Shifu meant they were bonded for life. He's like, listen, if you call me Shifu, mean it. It means we'll be bonded forever. You want to make Sifu happy, don't you? How he portrays himself and promotes a love of money has a massive psychological effect on his followers and students. For example, take this instance from copies of his interview with a former Locke student. Garrett, the student in question, mentions a conference he attended where Locke asked everyone to stand up. He said, I want you to imagine that you're standing on the edge of the cliff. Sifu appears over your shoulder and he says, I want you to jump. How many of you would jump? According to him, a few students said they would jump because they trusted Shifu. The blind trust people like this have in Dan Locke is kind of terrifying, but the cold light behavior doesn't even end here. The courses themselves are where Locke has truly dug his claws into his poor students and seems to have taken his teacher for life mentality quite seriously. As soon as you've finished one course, you're upsold on the next one and the next. Each is more expensive, less high quality than the last, but people still pay for them because they want to please their Shifu and believe that if they do all he has told them to, they will become millionaires. That they will be just as successful as he is. He even goes so far as to imply that he's going to hire people who are not then so subtly encouraged to purchase his next course as a way to guarantee they'll get the job, only to then tell them they won't be getting hired. This is what tipped me over the edge. Because, you know, this guy is basically like, yeah, I want to hire you. He's like, oh, so have you joined the Closer in Black program? And he basically shamed me into doing this thing. January comes around, 
He's like, yeah, I decided against it. I'm not going to hire you on. It almost seems to be a ploy used to get those who are more suspicious of his programs to keep going. One of the worst parts about this codependent relationship that many of Locke's students have formed with him is that many of them are starving, don't have jobs, or have gotten themselves into massive amounts of debt and can no longer afford to pay for the courses. And his employees will encourage them to take out more loans. Those who have managed to shatter the reality he's painted for them often don't speak out about what he has done, either because they're too embarrassed to admit they fell for a scam or because when they do, Locke tries to silence them. According to CoffeeZilla, one of the things that encouraged him to start going after Dan Locke was a story he heard about a teacher who tried to expose Locke. I talked to like, for example, a teacher who put in like $25,000, was in debt at one point and has nothing to show for it. I know, and it was sort of these tactics of pressuring, 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 and then anytime anyone would complain, he would try to silence them, so. She created a Facebook group explaining that his course was a scam and that it hadn't worked for her and many others. So Locke responded by suing her in an attempt to shut her up. Stories like this and the fact that Locke has no issue taking advantage of vulnerable people despite his background caused CoffeeZilla to refer to him as the reverse Robin Hood. Although it does seem like the consequences of his actions started catching up with him, as people began to notice that Locke never revealed how he makes money to his viewers. A writer on Medium, Hanin Abufa, talks about how all the people know that he has multiple streams of income from multiple businesses, and this is how he affords his luxurious lifestyle. And yet the only thing he ever mentions is copywriting, and as far as she is aware, there are no millionaire copywriters. How he makes his millions is not the only thing he's lied about either. In 2020, it came out that Locke didn't actually own the $35 million home he had claimed. The house was actually only valued at $13 million, and not only was Locke renting it out, but he had failed to pay his landlord. Locke alleged that he was terminating his tenancy because of numerous deficiencies discovered by home inspection, including heating and plumbing. And so of course the landlord commenced a home inspection of his own and discovered that there were absolutely no deficiencies that would render the rental property unfit for habitation as he had claimed. After Locke left the house on December 31st, it was discovered that it was in a state of disrepair and that the tenants failed to pay rent per their fixed term lease. This wouldn't be the last time that Locke landed in hot water. In 2020, Business Explained revealed that Locke had been charged with copyright infringement and plagiarism and could spend up to two years in prison with millions of dollars in damages. These charges were in relation to the work he had stolen from other creators such as Alex Chaffin and promoted as his own for his Dragon 100 path. This wasn't a mistake, this wasn't an accident, this is clear, belligerent, over-the-top content theft. He was called out by Spencer Cornelia a few months earlier, who made an entire video detailing how Locke had been copying content for years. And then CoffeeZilla jumped on this too. And over time, everyone now knows the truth about Dan Locke. But unfortunately, there are many more financial gurus out there, like Robert Kiyosaki. Robert Kiyosaki himself might not be a name that you recognize, but if we mention the name of his book Rich Dad Poor Dad, almost everyone knows the title, even if you haven't read it. The reason is Robert Kiyosaki's book was perhaps one of the most successful financial books out there. At first he self-published, but later on, Warner Books took it on and grew in popularity. Sales grew to over 41 million copies, so it's no surprise that Robert is of course extremely wealthy. He clearly offers people knowledge on how to get rich and some pretty basic financial advice, liabilities and investments. But there's much more to Robert than first meets the eye, and to understand why, you first need to understand how he became wealthy in the first place. Robert began his success in 1985 when he co-founded a company called Accelerated Learning Institute. This would kick off his trade of teaching sales, entrepreneurship, investing, and social responsibility. This means he first made his money by teaching other people how to make money, something almost all of these fake gurus do, and something he would continue to do throughout his entire life. If you take the modern world, where people are trying to teach you how to come in and trade actively in stocks. What's up, Tim Sykes, millionaire, mentor, and trader here. I want to teach you. I want to help you. Well, I regard that as roughly equivalent to trying to induce a bunch of young people to start off on heroin. We're here to support you. I want to see you on this jet with us next time. It's awesome, and you can totally do it. You love Join jets, us too. Right you love jets, too. Admit it. You come just on. don't know it. It is really stupid, and when you're already rich, to make your money by encouraging people to get rich by trading. If you're a millionaire, why sell a course? Um. Then there are people on the TV and they say, I have this book that will teach you how to make 300% a year. The millionaire booklet's gonna give you eight steps and guess what? And all you have to do is pay for shipping. First you're gonna pay shipping and handling. <laughs> In 1994, after investing in real estate, which did pay off massively, he wrote his first book, If You Want to Be Rich and Happy, Don't Go to School. The book did okay, and there wasn't anything inherently wrong with the book at all. But due to its mild success, he would then write another book. And three years later, Rich Dad Poor Dad would be born. 
whilst at the same time, he opened up a new company called Cashflow Technologies Inc. From here, there would seem to be a pattern forming with opening various companies, some are successful, some aren't. But as he was called out on the David Pakman show, a caller on the show would be one of the first to call him out. But a rich person like uh, Kiyosaki writes a scam book, this rich dad, poor dad scam book, then he gets in bed with Amway, which is a scam multi-level marketing thing, Yes, and forces Amway people to buy his book. Although the companies Roberts owned aren't his only source of income, he's not only earning royalties from his book, but also from about 7,000 investment properties which establish about a million a month as passive income. Seemingly on the surface, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with this guy. He gives fairly basic financial advice, has a bunch of companies, and seems like a generally successful guy. What's the problem? Well, according to an expose from the college investor, there's a darker side to Roberts. In the expose, they showed specifically how Roberts' businesses went bankrupt after failing to pay the proper royalties on his seminars. But the story actually goes a lot deeper than this. So the website exposed more about what Robert really does. Not only did Robert drag the company his name was attached to through the mud for unethical practices, but he failed to practice what he preached too. In August 2012, his then company Rich Global LLC filed for bankruptcy because the courts ordered a payment of about $24 million to Learning Annex. Ironically, Rich Global LLC didn't have the funds to support such a payout. The problem was that Rich Global LLC agreed to pay a percentage of his profits when he spoke at public engagements promoting his book, but Learning Annex never received said profit percentages and was forced to take the legal route to settle. Robert declared bankruptcy and closed the books on that company, leaving the employees jobless. And it seems that while Robert's pockets were aligned with silver and gold and personal capacity, the fact is that those under his leadership would only be considered his pawns while he had use for them. Had he honoured his agreements with Learning Annex, Rich Global LLC might have still been Rich Global instead of another bankrupt business under Robert's belt. Quote, even though his advice may sound good, be an owner invest in cash for investments, etc., the fact that he or his business didn't maintain solid financial health is just sad. For years, he's been called out as a quote fake guru and somebody who actually gives bad financial advice. Even the company he allegedly started is in question. According to a Forbes article, even the book that made him famous has its issues. No one has ever proven that Rich Dad, the man who supposedly gave Kiyosaki all his advice for wealthy living, ever actually existed. Nor has anyone ever documented any vast reserves of wealth earned by Kiyosaki prior to the publication of Rich Dad Poor Dad in 1997. Yet when the word scam comes up, people used to think of somebody shady or underhanded with a quick wit to cleverly outsmart someone for financial gain. Today we know it's different, with people like Logan Paul in CryptoZoo and a bunch of other huge influencers using their fame and fortune to scam their audiences. And while I'm not saying Robert Kiyosaki is a scammer, you wouldn't expect a well-established millionaire to have some predatory business practices. And when I say predatory, he isn't outright scamming and he isn't doing criminal acts, but he does have some questionable businesses. For example, Robert runs his rich dad educational courses like a peddling drug dealer. The first course is free and often comes with an invest in yourself mentality. You're fulfilling your true purpose if you commit your life to the highest advantage of others basically preparing you to want to pull out the credit cards as you move over to the second course at a price of $500, and the third at such a double taking rate of $45,000. Now, of course, most courses aren't always scams. A lot of the times you pay more money to get great information and learn more about your craft from specialists. And I don't actually have anything against this stuff. I think it's fair to charge for advice. However, it's important to be reasonable for your services and what you're actually providing. You see, if you're trying to help someone get rich and provide value, $495 could be reasonable. But how how could $45,000 ever be reasonable for any personal finance class? Furthermore, would you ever pay that given the credibility issues raised by the teacher himself? It's the same thing that many fake gurus do and why they're so haters. Even Grant Cardone came for Robert Kiyosaki. After Kiyosaki explained how much he disagreed with Cardone's work, Cardone shot back calling out Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad book. Understanding that his Rich Dad didn't ever actually exist, he explained that he wasn't sure Kiyosaki even wrote the book himself. Just do more of what you say, dude. Why, why don't you own $4 billion worth of real estate? During these courses, it's also reported that it's almost forcefully shoved down your neck that you have to buy the next course if you're already this invested. And so it stands to reason that you would feel it is the next step to being successful in your life, especially if you're desperate. Again, this is an implied get rich quick scheme that always seems to disappoint. Worse yet, the devil is in the details. With some courses that are on offer for $99, they'll eagerly be bought. And before you know it, you're sucked into a six month contract because you didn't read the fine print. Now, Robert is clever enough to keep the safety 
you have a one month money back guarantee, but most can't get a response within that month so the guarantee falls away anyway, leaving a six month commitment added to an already stressed out budget. Much like Dan Locke, Robert knows his audience and preys on the desperate and hopeful with these courses that pan out to be nothing more than motivational hype mixed with sales or financial tips. Then there's multi-level marketing, which is another more complicated name for a pyramid scheme. However, according to Robert Kiyosaki, a pyramid scheme isn't bad because much like a business since just like a boss, there's a boss at the top and people get paid less and less as it goes down the ladder. He even has his own word for them, calling it network marketing instead. Well, let me tell you why I endorse network marketing or why I call it the power of it. And Robert straight up calls this a sound business choice. So we're talking about a subject that some lot of people misunderstand is called network marketing. And this starts to make sense when he's at the top of most of these schemes anyway. Amway, for example, is a controversial pyramid scheme linked to many fraudulent scandals. And for the most part, people know this to be one of the get rich quick schemes. In fact, CoffeeZilla is one of those who exposed and showed the reality of Amway. No, seriously, if you work a minimum wage job at McDonald's, you're making more than 90% of Amway employees. Robert too was involved with this company, and although he has since parted ways with Amway, he still made millions from the MOM. Robert talks about his cash flow quadrant and breaks it down to four key areas. So E stands for employee, S stands for self-employed, small business or specialist, like a doctor or a lawyer. B stands for big business, 500 employees or more, and I stands for investor. In his books and seminars, he will tell you that MOM is a B, but everyone else involved in a multi-level marketing scheme is an E. And the explanation is obvious for a few reasons. In multi-level marketing, you are a small fish in a big pond. Business without you could continue as normal and you can get fired or drop out, whereas a big business owner losing their owner is a big problem. You're not in full control, so MOM is an E, a sales rep working on a sliding scales commission structure at best. If however you are successful, then you might be pushed into an S, but it comes with more cost for training material and basically, it's still could be lost as the trade is unstable and those underneath you could drop out. So a very shaky S at that, who would sign up under you and so the web of marketing flows. But there are so many risks and costs hidden underneath. Under the banner of investing in an MOM, it is nothing short of an administration fee, because as you sign up, there is no existing business that you're investing to. You will still need to generate that business for it to be successful. As MOMs aren't selling a business, they're selling a dream to desperate people. In 2007, Robert was encouraging everyone to invest in real estate just before the housing crash happened in 2008. And they'll be actually talking about a real real estate deal that we have done where we got an infinite return. From a financial perspective, it seems like Robert didn't do his homework. And while the market may be unpredictable, perhaps you shouldn't be advising such a huge risk in an area of such instability. And now today, he goes on podcasts talking about how he's happy to be billions in debt and how all successful people are. I'm a billion dollars in debt. You're a billion in debt. In fact, in 2012, Robert Kiyosaki went bankrupt over a few class action lawsuits because the stuff in his course was not worth the value of the price he cost, making you wonder if being in debt really is a great thing after all. In fact, ABC 2020 did a test of sending three people out with $1,000 with a time frame of 20 days under Robert's personal guidance, and all three failed to produce an income from it. The conclusional results were that Robert never actually gave any direction on how to get started or gave any concrete instruction, but it only left you feeling out about possibly making it big. It seems like Robert was good at making people believe that there is something out there, and some of the teachings are good, and making people optimistic about their financial future is a great thing to do, but it doesn't really satisfy what he presents that you will achieve in taking his course. And this is the type of thing that many are calling Kiyosaki out for today. And the reason why I'm so against these educational events is because of how much they charge and how much they prey on the weak and vulnerable. And although he's been called out as a fake guru by many YouTubers and people online, he's been relatively unscathed. And to be fair, isn't anywhere near as bad as the other people on this list. Something that this next fake guru can't say. Meet Kevin. Kevin Pafath. Meet Kevin started out as a real estate agent who eventually created a YouTube channel explaining everything real estate and honestly began with some great advice. He had relevant and a charming personality that people enjoyed. It took a while to gain any traction on the platform, but as he experimented and continued grinding out the videos, the viewers would roll in. His first big video was ironically calling out Grant Cardone. In his video Grant Cardone and Cardone Capital Exposed, he explains how Cardone leverages other people's money in real estate investments and creates value through syndication. By the way, the other thing that's brilliant about the Grant Cardone model is he, your money is locked up in the fund until the project is done. That's great because Grant can really plan out his leverage on that deal you invested in 
take that leverage we talked about, use it in other deals. Not only that, Bob Cardone also provides tips and insights for individuals looking to start their own real estate investing, highlighting the importance of understanding market dynamics, investment strategies, and how to gain equity through property renovations, yet sticks to vague situations. Now this video received over 1 million views, and while most of his other videos were receiving below 10k views, this did give his channel the traction it needed, and me Kevin would even admit that he used Grant Cardone's name as a way to get famous, which is a normal strategy in social media, and it worked, so he began to settle into a niche. But the rest of his videos over the following years would usually center around real estate, something he has a lot of experience with. You see, most of his background was in the real estate business, and he even admits this. To me, real estate's freaking easy, because I look at this stuff and I go, I know what to do. Stocks, I don't know. <laughs> so don't ever expect meet Kevin to sell you a stock investing course. He picked up a niche in the finance field on YouTube and did moderately well. He got some views, but it wasn't enough for him. He wanted to get to the top. This was too niche. And while me Kevin was getting a few thousand views, this wasn't going to change anything. And yet somehow he was noticing newer creators doing something similar to him, but was somehow reaching hundreds of thousands of views in each video they made. And me Kevin wanted a piece of the pie. And so soon enough, he would move into the typical financial advice space, where according to many YouTubers, he became everything he sought to destroy. He knew how to tell a story, get a simple concept about anything, and turn it into a great lesson. But remember that clip you saw moments ago where he straight up explained that he understood real estate and that he wouldn't sell some sort of stock course? This seemed to not really be true, as he would very quickly release his new course on how to buy stocks. So sure, he could have gone and studied and tested it out. In fact, that's what you'd expect as he soon turned from a great real estate advice guy into what his current bias shows as a licensed financial advisor, active ETF manager, real estate broker, former lender, former licensed contractor, and educator. Which many YouTubers and people online would claim is a reach considering he made almost all of his money from real estate. But all of this wouldn't matter, and it would be absolutely fine if he put his money where his mouth was and actually made his viewers some good money. But today, Meet Kevin is known by other names. If you go online, you see these things like Meet Scams, YouTube's biggest grifter, and more. And whilst this might seem hyperbolic, there is some truth to some of these claims. To understand this, we need to skip forward to 2024, where Meet Kevin has now reached over 1.9 million subscribers, producing nearly 3,900 videos. That means there's a bunch of content out there, and a bunch he's learned over this time period. But it seems in the industry he might have lost his place, and although he was once well respected, the typical finance YouTuber journey has soaked him in, and his advice has turned out pretty badly, according to a channel called Echoes From Above, a YouTuber that would regularly call him out time and time again for his reckless information. Making endless videos discussing how bullish he is on Tesla, it turns out this same guy is down tremendously on Tesla stock. Because of this small content creator's videos, Kevin was unhappy about it, and sent the channel a copy strike to take down the video. Kevin actually filed a claim against my video. It wasn't actually a copyright strike. It was actually a cyberbullying threats and harassment claim is what he filed uh, on my video. Something which could actually happen to this video right now. Now, if you don't already know, three strikes of this specific category and your YouTube channel is full on deleted, stopping you from uploading and losing all the revenue from that video. Not only was this a terrible move to take against such a small YouTuber, but it also made his audience turn on him, especially since he himself got his first big break on YouTube through making a similar video on Grant Cardone. Another YouTuber would eventually take a much deeper dive into Meet Kevin's past, exposing even more. He would take a deep dive looking at all the stocks that Kevin had convinced his audience to jump to, even showing how within one year of posting a video giving financial advice for a specific stock, Meet Kevin would make the perfect list of stocks somebody would want to short. That list is seven of Meet Kevin's most profitable stocks to invest in, none of which performed well and had dropped by nearly 50% within the next year. These were his top picks, meaning the ones he had done the most research and was most confident in, clearly proving to be a bad analysis. Now, the YouTuber who took this deep dive into Meet Kevin's YouTube channel was King of Nothing, who detailed exactly how bad the advice Kevin gives to his audience was, how almost every penny stock that Meet Kevin suggested his audience invest in has turned out to fail miserably. I recommend checking out this video because almost every stock he recommends in this video is down massively since he published it. One particular video in which he called out was Meet Kevin's over-enthusiasm in a company called Affirm, calling it the Tesla of Finance. Now, to be fair, Meet Kevin did put in $1 million of his own money into the company stocks. But why would he do such a thing? It's kind of crazy. If you've never heard of a firm, it was this idea of bringing loans and financing to people who want to buy cheaper items such as AirPods and similar things, something that the poor need financing for. The concept seems good to one person, the person who'd be benefiting the most, the poor. But if you put just five minutes of thought into the concept, you'd see how the business model was never going to do well. And most people realize this. When promoting the video, a firm's stock price was about $125. And it really didn't take very long for a firm's stocks to plummet to under $9. Sure, this is nitpicking one of his particularly bad 
bad examples. But we'd be here all day if we were to show you every bad stock that he's named the Tesla of Insert Random Industry. And the way he's funding all these investments is through his courses. When King of Nothing covered his fake guru courses, he explained that sending valuable information you might have isn't necessarily a bad thing, which is completely true. Now look, there's nothing inherently wrong with selling a course. If you feel you have knowledge that people could benefit from and there's potential for a high return on investment into that knowledge, it makes sense to sell a course. Of course you can sell expensive courses on specific knowledge. So this isn't the issue. Because if this knowledge is really valuable, if you can't find this anywhere else, then yes, you can pay more for that course. But almost every one of me Kevin's courses was regurgitated information that you could simply find on Wikipedia. King of Nothing would also reveal how me Kevin alongside Grant Cardone would apparently promote quote a literal pyramid scheme company that King of Nothing used to work at. This was EXPI, and me Kevin made the confident claim that Grant Cardone was about to 10x the stock he himself had invested over $620,000 into. The metaverse stock would hit an all-time high just four days later, but then plummet over 80%. Something we see with these people is that if anybody knows how to talk well, people will believe you. Me Kevin would even release his own ETF, which of course performed pretty poorly. Yet compared to the rest, he doesn't seem as bad. But one shocking claim was that when Me Kevin tried to be the governor of California, residents would call out his abuse of the system, applying for a PPP loan of $30,000, in which Kevin allegedly abused the system and according to multiple YouTubers, stole from the state of California after the loan was also forgiven. But again, it doesn't seem as bad as the next person on this list at all. And many things he's done do seem to be kind of shady, but I can't prove categorically, as many online have accused him of running an illegal pump and dump in his Discord, but this can't really be proven, and so I wouldn't claim that this is true. But thankfully today, he's pivoting towards more politics, making fewer and fewer finance videos than he did before. But one man you really need to know about is Timothy Sykes. Timothy Sykes has told a few contrasting stories about how he got involved in the stock trading industry, but it's widely known within his fan base that he started when he was in high school. After suffering a tennis injury, Sky had a lot of free time on his hands. Sitting around with nothing to do, his interest was piqued by the hype surrounding the stock market and investors' excitement. So he decided to take the $12,415 that he had been gifted at his bar mitzvah and invested it into day trading. He lost money at first, but soon he noticed patterns and his money began to increase. And by the time he went to university, university, he'd apparently earned $1.65 million. But unfortunately it appears that this stroke of luck was his only genuine success. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in philosophy in 2003, he founded a hedge fund named Cilantro Fund Management in the same year. Operating from an apartment in Connecticut listed under his stepfather's name, Skye's never handled anything more than the money entrusted to him by friends and family, which is fortunate because after three years, Cilantro was shut down due to heavy losses. However, he wouldn't let his failures stop him, and he claimed it wasn't crucial because his story could help ordinary investors understand the mechanisms behind the market and a trader's mentality. He never let Cilantro go and continued to claim that it was quote the number one long short micro stock hedge fund in the country according to Barclays. As impressive as this sounds, people realized how insignificant the statement was when it came out that he wasn't talking about the giant Barclays bank, he was talking about another Barclays, a small company based in Iowa. Given that Skye's claims to have grown up in a middle class family, you'd think that a failure like this would make a comeback impossible. But the thing is, his family never was middle class. Not only did the university he attended have an incredibly wealthy student body, but Skies is the great great grandson of Rudolf Libby, the founder of the successful jewelry business Skies Libby Jewelers, which eventually fell into the ownership of Joanne Skies, Timothy's mother. It seems very probable that his parents helped him get back on his feet after his initial failure. However, even if they did help him, his failures wouldn't stop there. He would then go on to found a second hedge fund, and when that was shut down, he decided it was time to become an author and write and American hedge fund, how I made $2 million as a stock operator and created a hedge fund. While the book's rating doesn't fall below a 4 star rating on most sites, people don't have the highest opinion, with many claiming that it was pretty braggy, and that he often blamed the limits of the Securities and Exchange Commission for his failures. An article on Medium described the self-published book as quote, an unreadable fantasy account of make-believe money and phony success. Many people would find it difficult, if not impossible, to preach about achieving success while standing atop a mountain of failures. Still, Sykes mastered the art of selling people dreams and bad advice, and unfortunately many people have fallen prey to his schemes. Similar to Grant Cardone and Robert Kiyosaki, his videos do often have some great advice. We all have different backgrounds. It doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter how much money or how little money you have, it's putting in the time to study, putting in the time to learn, putting in the time to trade. But then mashed up with this terrible advice that essentially taints the advice altogether. For me, I want to actually utilize all different kinds of companies and stocks in the stock market to get me richer. 
Pump and dumps and penny stocks have worked the best for me and my top millionaire students. But as this book started to sell and he told the dream of how to make more money, he would appear on shows like Below Deck and Wall Street Warriors. And young aspiring traders who saw how he was living began to idolize him as a god. These shows and a 2006 article that placed him on a 30 under 30 list of promising investors gave Sykes the platform he needed to become a stock guru without ever actually proving his trading skills. And the funny thing is that the magazine editor that put him on 30 under 30 revealed that he was their worst pick that year. Taking full advantage of his new platform, Sykes began advertising his incredibly expensive course. 90% of traders lose money. Don't be one of them. Learn from my DVDs, okay? These DVDs are meant to make you a successful trader. This is penny stocking. This is the original DVD of mine. Uh, how I turned 12,000 into 2 million. $300 pays for itself in one good trade. And unfortunately, those who decided to pay for everything he had available soon learned that it was a complete waste of money. Not only does his course feature poor quality videos, but much of the information he relays throughout is outdated and difficult to follow. A Redditor named Trader King MO said that while he started them off on their trading journey, the price really wasn't worth it because he spent two plus hours blabbering instead of really honing in on the process. And the course was structured in a way that required you to research half the stuff he was talking about. According to an anonymous user on Quora, another customer said, quote, I lost $2,000 in one of his scam webinars. He claims he had two stocks he had researched extensively and promised a person could make $9,050 in three to four days if the person got in immediately. So I bought the next morning with a 25% stop loss and the stocks took a no dive immediately. This guy's a scam artist and he is probably making more money from conning people into his sales pitch than he is from trading penny stocks. This is probably why he is so rich. Expensive lesson learned and quotes. But these aren't the only ones. Sites like Dirty Scams are filled with people telling their own stories. Funnily enough, even with the controversy surrounding Timothy, he still gets incredibly heated with other investors and celebrities doing the same kind of thing as him. During an interview with Jeff Lerner, he takes a moment to criticize Pump and Dumpers, specifically Jordan Belfort, calling him a bad dude. If you want to learn from Jordan Belfort, if you want to learn how to be a career criminal, I think he is the best career criminal ever. If you want to learn how to throw out ethics and, you know, have no guilt over, like, literally thousands of people whose lives you have destroyed, he is the man to learn from. Which may be true, but coming from him, it seems a little bit hypocritical. But it's not only anonymous Reddit users calling out Sykes. There have been various people exposing his bad advice, claiming that this guy is a complete fake guru. One channel called Best Stock Strategy released a video exposing Sykes, where he points out the many areas where he falls short. But one particular issue he found was that Timothy Sykes could not substantiate his claims that he managed to turn $12,000 into $1 million plus. Has told me that he provides audited returns, which is a complete lie. This was a claim he used to aggressively sell a course of his own naturally. The man exposed Using him search for all evidence of the payment stocks purchased and payments made that Sykes claimed in the course, but none of it could be proven. So he went on to call an employee of Sykes who explained that it was all true and that there was an accountant who audited financial statements. The alleged account that Sykes' employee referred to wasn't able to locate any audits done on Timothy Sykes. They did have a compilation of Sykes, but that was all. After bringing this back up to the same employee who promised audited statements, the employee put down the phone and the answer to this question remains still pretty unclear. In another video by Be The Trader, he interviews a bunch of Sykes' students who forked out thousands on his courses, all of whom share their negative experiences. It's that, that's just, I'm sorry, man, it's ridiculous. It honestly left a bad taste in my mouth. From the poor quality of the information received throughout the course, feeling like he simply wasted time explaining the same things he offered viewers on his channel for free, they all agreed that he gives the typical vague information that could be applied to anything, something that fake gurus would do consistently. The only thing he did do well was the production, keeping his students as engaged as possible. This is why he still has such a cult following. Following. He knows how to keep people listening. Unfortunately, the people who take his courses aren't the only people he's annoyed. In 2021, in an article titled, Is Tim for Tim Sykes to Take a Hike? Lance Crayon mentioned Kamagawa Apiro LLC, formerly the Timothy Sykes Foundation. And whilst I wasn't really sure how accurate his claims about Kamagawa were, they did inspire me to look into the charity. And there you can find something very disturbing. Among the many charities that Kamagawa distributes its profits, one stood out that was Save the Children. As pointed out by Reddit user Inquire on the R Exposing Instagram live thread on Reddit, Save the Children has a very bad history. But in 2021, there were 42 cases of staff mistreating the children they were supposed to be helping. Seven were instances of physical abuse, while two were sexual abuse. And while Save the Children took care of the staff responsible, this wasn't the only time they've had these sorts of issues. Many people were rubbed the wrong way when Sykes failed to comment on the situation. It implied that he wasn't nearly as invested in these charities as he seemed. And what makes this all so ironic is that Sykes has a video explaining how to spot fake trading gurus, but fails to see how he's practically 
publicly exposing himself. He explains that legitimate mentors should demonstrate a history of real, verifiable success, yet as we saw earlier, the audit could not be verified and likely doesn't even exist. He explains that real educators stress the importance of understanding and don't encourage following anyone's trades or advice, regularly offering a guide on copy trading and providing alerts radar on all his own trades. But he fails to mention that the real way he makes money is by forcing viewers to believe in a false dream that he perpetuates, a false image of making money so simply from trading, and yet all his money comes from courses, but he won't teach you how to do that. That's why he'll call someone lazy and a hater for pointing out that the information he shares in his course is free elsewhere, and yet to this day he still has a very avid following of people who go out of their way to defend him. 